Good morning. Welcome to Forest Lake. We're so great to see you out today on this beautiful Sunday. Look forward to worshiping as we continue in our series on the seven holy virtues. Last week we did faith. This week we will do hope. Next week we'll do love. And that will wrap up the spiritual virtue, virtues before moving into the cardinal virtues. Uh, got a few programming notes today that I need to share with you. Um, first off, you'll notice that I am not in my robe. Uh, our, apparently our fan belt on our HVAC has broken. And so while the air is running, it's just not blowing. And so it is a little bit warmer in here than we'd like it to be. Please forgive that. If you need to remove jackets uh, or sweaters, then please feel free to do so. Uh, after the special, I will invite the choir to move down. The choir loft is a few degrees warmer than where you're sitting. And I will invite them after their anthem to move down into the sanctuary if they'd like so they can cool off just a little bit. Our apologies for the inconvenience. We should have it fixed well before next Sunday. Please forgive it. Uh, also, on programming notes, our Internet is down. <laughs> Again. Uh, and so we are not live streaming right now. This service will be available later as a recording. So for all of you watching us as a recording, we are glad that you're here, and we're glad that your air conditioning works. Um, but we are, uh, we are happy to have you as part of our church family this, uh, this morning. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and uh, our associate pastor, Zach Head, is sick this morning. Uh, so uh, I will be handling the rest of the service, and if anything else goes wrong, we may just quit and go home. I don't know. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's... Uh, it's fine. We are, it, it just so happens that the beginning of my scripture text, Paul is talking about suffering in the present age. And so just consider the whole, the whole morning an object lesson in our sufferings for Christ. I am glad you're here, and thank you for your patience as we work through uh, some of these challenges. I have a few announcements to share as we get going. Even though it's summertime, we are fairly busy. Um, in the morning, we have our first tonight, we've got a youth fireside at 6 p.m. In the morning, we have uh, Missions Monday at 10. The Chosen Study on the Chosen TV series about the life of Christ will meet at 6 tomorrow evening in the Connections classroom. Uh, troop committee meeting will be tomorrow at 6.30 for our scout troop. And then scouts will meet also at 6.30. Tuesday, we'll have our morning Bible study at 10.30. We are continuing in the Ten Commandments. It's been a good discussion we encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, also, Tuesday, we're scheduled for youth golf at uh, Top Golf in Birmingham. Wednesday, we have a sewing class that is for children and their parents. It will actually be at St. Luke. Our own Faye LeClaire will be teaching it. It's from 1 to 3. And if you're interested in sewing, let her know. But please do let Faye know that you're coming so she'll have the proper supplies. Uh, bridge at 3 o'clock Wednesday afternoon. And then this Wednesday, we are back to our midweek meal. For one, week, for one week only, during the summer, we do our midweek meal once a month. And this Wednesday is the, uh, is the night. So we invite you to go ahead and sign up on the worship attendance pads. Let us know how many will be eating with us. If you're not sure today, try to call the office by noon on Tuesday uh, or email the office or something because with the Internet out, our phone, our phone service is out. So. But let us know if you're able that you can be with us Wednesday night. Um, and then uh, youth Bible study following that. So a lot going on this week. I hope you find a place to plug in and be involved. Thank you again for being here, and now will you prepare your hearts with me for worship. <laughs>
Now I invite you to join in our call to worship. I will read both parts so that the people worshiping online with us can hear that response as well. In the midst of difficult times, we have new life from Christ. When we think that there is no hope, God offers us healing love. Come, let us praise the God of new life. Let us sing and shout for joy. Let us worship the one who is with us forever. Thanks be to God for all God's blessings. Amen. We invite you to either stand or remain seated as you please and join with us in our opening hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, number 89 in your hymnals or on the screen. We'll sing the first, the second, and the fourth verses. you now to join with us in our affirmation of faith found in your bulletins and on the screen. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'll invite the ushers to come forward now. As they come, I want to say a quick thank you for your incredible generosity, the way you're continuing to change lives with your gifts. This week, we sent off a check to Turning Point for $575. Turning Point's a shelter for battered women. They needed baby beds for some of the children that came in. So because of your love and concern, those children have a safe place to sleep. Thank you for your generosity. You are making a difference. And now, let us pray. 
Almighty God, all that we have comes from you. You have been more generous with us than we deserve. So help us now to give back a portion. Bless and multiply these gifts and use them to expand your kingdom into Tuscaloosa and the county beyond and the world beyond that. Lord, we offer ourselves and our gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll call your attention to the prayer concerns that you find listed in the bulletin. I encourage you to keep those names with you throughout the week. Join with me in praying for those people day by day as we go through the week. It's an important part of my daily devotion. I hope it is yours as well. If you would like your name included on that list, please let me know or let Noel know in the church office. Or if you've reached, a, if you've been on the list and things are doing much better now and you're ready to be removed, let us know that as well. We do think we have seen, we have seen the impacts of prayer in our church family really over the last two or three or four weeks. We've seen people that were in difficult times that, that have come out of those, and we give God the glory for that. So we take this, take this part of our ministry seriously. Now we invite you to bow your heads and your hearts with me in prayer. Almighty God, pour out your spirit on your church gathered here. Fill us today as you did on that very first Pentecost. Fill us with power to be witnesses in Tuscaloosa and the county beyond and the world beyond that. Give us a, min a mission of sharing your grace and your love with those around us who feel left out, who feel excluded from your church, who feel excluded from your grace. Lord, help us to penetrate that, that community with good news, with good news that you have come to love, to save, to rescue all of us. Lord, we especially pray for those that are on our prayer concerns list. We ask that you would be our great physician, that you would heal them, restore them, 
that you would give them hope, that whatever is lacking in their lives, Lord, that you would fill that need. We also pray for those that are on our hearts that remain unnamed, that you would be very present in each one of those situations. And especially this morning, Lord, we pray for those that are on nobody's list, for those that are left out and forgotten in our world. Lord, I pray that they might experience your incredible love, your incredible acceptance, that they might feel your loving arms wrapped around them. Lord, we pray for our community, uh, local, state, and nation. We are in a horribly divided time, Lord. And yet you are our Prince of Peace. Help us to be messengers of the Prince of Peace and help us carry that message until finally our swords are beaten into plowshares, until finally the lion does, in fact, lay down with the lamb. Lord, we continue to hope for those things that seem impossible because you are the author and the perfecter of our hope. Lord, I pray for Forest Lake that you would continue to bless your church here, that you would work through us to accomplish all that you desire for your kingdom. Father, we pray all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Dr. Skip Sneed. He is the head of the School of Music at the University of Alabama. He's my friend. And he agreed to come here and play the horn part for this morning's anthem. So.
Thank you, Skip. Thank you to the choir, and thank you to Skip for the beautiful job with the French horn. Beautiful instrument. Played very well. Thank you. We will give our choir a moment to move down where it's a few degrees cooler. As we do, I also offer an apology. I'm not used to leading the liturgy part of the service. I realized I left out a hymn. It was not intentional, but considering the room is heating up, it might not be a bad plan either. Uh, so please forgive the oversight. Today we do continue in our series on the seven holy virtues. This week it's on faith. Last, or excuse me, last week was faith. This week is hope. Our text for this week comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 18 through 25. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Let us pray. Almighty God, fill us with that hope and the endurance to work along with you to accomplish all that you desire for our lives and for our community. Lord, help us to press on in hope of all that you will accomplish. Lord, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Every one of us has hope. It is a gift of God. It's a gift that comes when we receive Christ. It's, not, uh, it's an infused gift, like faith and love. It's not something that we earn or learn God gives it to us freely. And so we all have hope. We're just not real sure what it is. We misuse the word a lot. We, we use it in other sorts of ways. We, we use it all sorts of ways. We say, well, I hope you have a good day. I hope you enjoy your trip. I hope you get well soon. Those are all good things, but it's not really what the Bible is getting at with hope. Sometimes we use it negatively. Well, I hope he gets what he deserves. Right. I hope he falls on his, well, you know. We use hope in all sorts of ways without really understanding it. It's one of the, one of the seven virtues that's so critical to our lives, but we're really, and we all have it, but we're really not sure how to define it other than we want something to happen. In 1988, I was appointed to my very first church. I'd just become a pastor. I was up in northern Fayette County, and as a new pastor uh, and new to that particular church, I was eager to find out what, my, what the expectations of my church members were. So I visited around. I sat in one lady's living room. She was well into her 80s, and I asked her about her hopes for the future of our church, Musgrove Chapel. She said to me, I still remember it, I just hope the church can stay open long enough for me to have my funeral there. I understand her sentiment. She was a lifelong member of that church. She had spent decades serving God in that community. It's only natural that she would want her final celebration in the church that she knew and loved, right? I, I get that. At the same time, what a sad vision for church that is. I just hope we can stay open a few more years so I can be buried there. I, I don't want to die before the church closes. I hope I don't die before the church closes. That, that kind of hope is not very hopeful, is it? In fact, it's not hope at all. What we call hope there is actually fear masquerading as hope. 
She said, I, I hope I don't. She's saying, I hope that the church stays open long enough for me to be buried there. But what she was really communicating was, I'm afraid the church is going to close before I die. We do that quite frequently, I think. We say, I hope I don't run out of money before my next payday. It really means I'm afraid the paycheck's going to run out a few days too early, doesn't it? I hope my car doesn't die before I finish paying for it. It means I'm afraid that I'm going to be still making payments on a car that no longer runs. We use the word hope to make a positive spin on fear. In reality, a lot of the things that we hope for, or we're just hoping nothing bad is going to happen instead. That's not the biblical sense. The word that, the word that Paul uses, it'll be on the screen, is el peace. Uh, el peace is, according to Vines, is a favorable and confident expectation. Favorable and confident. Biblical hope is looking forward to a good thing happening, confident that it will happen. Favorable and confident as you look at the way that word is used throughout the New Testament, it almost never refers to something negative. I hope I don't die. No. It's almost always it is something positive, uh, that, that God is going to do something, and I am confident that a favorable thing will happen. That's the word El Peace that Paul uses in this. That's the biblical idea of hope that we have, that good things are coming. Not just that bad things aren't going to catch us. So, as we look at, at biblical hope, part of it is just expecting good things. But it's even more than that. It's not just wanting something good to happen. I hope that I can get back down to 175 pounds and stay there. I really hope I can. Meanwhile, my bicycle is hanging on a hook in the garage collecting dust and spider webs. Uh, meanwhile, while I'm hoping to get down to 175, last Sunday evening at dinner, we went out for Mexican, and uh, I ate an entire basket of chips and dip by myself before eating my entree. I hope to get... Now, I don't really hope that, do I? I'd like to, but biblical hope is more than just wishing something good would happen. In fact... That kind of hope really is just wishing. You know, I hope to run a marathon. I'm not doing any training, but I can say I hope to run a marathon. But if I, until I start training, I'm just wishing. I can say that I hope to be debt-free in two years, but unless I change my spending habits, I'm just wishing. And I think a lot of times in the church, I don't know, it seems like ever so often the church gets together to vision, to plan for the future, and we list all of these hopes. And if we were real honest with ourselves, we're not hoping, we're wishing. We're wishing that somehow this good thing might fall down out of the sky and hit us almost accidentally rather than us cooperating in it happening. Hope without our efforts is just wishing. And that's also not what Paul had in mind. Biblical hope is so much more than that. Biblical hope involves us along with God's goodness. In fact, Thomas Aquinas defined biblical hope like this, a future good, difficult, but possible to attain by means of the divine assistance on whose help it leans. Divine assistance. Key on that word for just a minute. In other words, we need not expect that God's just going to dump it in our laps, do it all for us, and leave us out of the process. That's not what biblical hope is, but it's a confidence that this future good will happen with divine assistance, with God helping us out. But that, if God is helping us out, that means that we are bringing something to the party, right? We have a contribution to make. We are co-creators with God in making this hoped-for thing come to reality. Last week we talked about faith. We said that faith says, I believe it, and so I'm going to act on it. If we don't act on it, we don't really have faith in it, right? So faith says, I believe it, so I'm going to act on it. Hope says, I believe that it will happen, so I'm going to cooperate with God in bringing it into reality. I believe that it's going to happen, 
And so I'm going to get up and move. I'm going to do something to make it happen. We are co-creators with God in bringing about the hoped-for future. That's why I believe Paul says in the same passage that we are... Uh, that we wait for what we've not seen with patience in the translation I read today. The actual word there is hupomone, which is really probably better translated endurance or long-suffering. Wait, wait for what we don't see with endurance. Again, that, that has the meaning with it that we're going to be doing something too. Paul even compares it. Paul says that we are in the midst of labor pains in bringing this thing apart. Now, I'm out, of my, I'm out of my depth here, I know. Now, I'm a guy talking about labor pains that always makes me nervous. But I have seen women in labor pains. And they are very much involved in the process. God is giving new life through that, uh, through that woman, but she is very much involved in the process, right? Any of you ladies want to disagree with that? We are. We are involved in the process. God is giving us his future, but yet we are involved in the pangs of labor. We are involved in the endurance, the long suffering of making it come about. And that might mean, uh, that might mean suffering. It might mean our work. It might mean our devotion to fulfilling this thing. But we've got a part to play. It's not just sitting around wishing that this good thing might happen at some point in the future. We play a role. So what is it for us? Paul says, Paul says that I consider that the current suffering is nothing compared to what we're hoping for. Whatever it is that we're going through right now, Paul says, is nothing compared to the future glory on which we've set our hope. Now we've been through a little bit, hadn't we? We have had our share of suffering lately over the last two or three years. We've been through a pandemic killed over a million Americans and shut down our doors for months, something no, none of us ever thought would happen. It changed us forever. We've been through denominational division. Uh, a few, three or four years ago, our district had 78 churches. Now we have 26. That feels rough. We're in a period of time when the world around us is less and less interested in organized religion they now tell us that less than 50 percent of people in the united states are actively involved in organized religion of any kind not just christianity christianity hinduism buddhism islam the whole judaism it's less than 50 percent involved in organized religion of any kind our numbers are down uh, like most churches we dropped about 50 percent through the pandemic that's hard isn't it all of, almost all of us in the room can look around and remember when there were twice this number of people here on Sunday mornings. And it's easy to despair. It's easy for us to begin to say, well, I just hope we can survive. I hope Forrest Lake can hang on. No, no, that's the wrong kind of hope. That is hope, that, that is fear masquerading as hope. That is fear pretending to be hope. Now, the reality is that God is ushering in God's kingdom into this world. The kingdom of God is coming into Tuscaloosa. It is happening. It will happen because God's not going to let anything get in the way. The pandemic is not big enough to stop God's will from coming into the world. Our denominational division is not big enough to prevent God from doing what God will do in Tuscaloosa and beyond. The, the crazy political stuff going on in our in our government around us is not big enough to overwhelm what God is wanting to do. The reality is, I just heard the same message from our new DS that will be starting next month. It is a great time to be the church. We have tremendous opportunity to spread hope among people that have formerly been left out. It is a great time for us to embark on the mission of God in this world. I have great hope that God is going to accomplish what we cannot even imagine through the church in our time. But it won't always be easy. There may be days we want to quit. I have those days. I actually, not too long ago, sat down and counted out the number of months until retirement. 
When I saw the number get that high, I figured I better get back to work. <laughs> we might want to quit. We might despair. We might get tired of it. We might suffer. But the sufferings of this present age do not compare with our hope of the future glory. But again, this is not just wishful thinking. This kind of hope requires that I get involved, that you get involved. Uh, hope is a cooperative effort between us and God. And so I want to really ask you two questions today, and I wrote them down. I had them, had them put in the bulletin, and I hope that you'll take that bulletin this afternoon, maybe during worship today. I hope that you'll jot down some answers to it, that you'll prayerfully consider these two questions. The first one, for what are you hoping? Now be careful when you write that down. I, I, not what are you afraid is going to happen. Yeah. I, I, hope I, I hope I make it to 90. No, that means I'm afraid I'm going to die in my 80s, right? So not something masquerading as fear. What do you hope will happen? And here's mine. I, I, did, I did my own homework this week ahead of the sermon. Mine is that I hope to build relationships with and reach folks who have given up on God and have been hurt by the church. I hope to make real connections with those people that might help them to understand the grace of God. That's my hope. And I'm excited. So what are you hoping for? Or write English. For what are you hoping for? Write it down. Maybe during the invitation today, maybe this afternoon, but go ahead and write it down. Hold yourself accountable to that thing. This is what I have confidence that God is going to do. This is a favorable outcome that I'm confident can happen if God and I work together. The second thing that I have on that, the second question, is what am I going to do about it? Because we're not just wishing. What am I doing about it? I've, I had a real, my scale and I had a real come to Jesus moment um, Monday morning when I got on and I saw what eating a full basket of chips does to you. And so this week I've changed some things. I've improved my diet. I've started drinking water, which is horrible. I don't even think my body likes it. It's been fighting back all week. But I've had like 60 ounces or more of water a day. Because I can't just wish, I have to hope. And I, I really hope, I'm hoping for the day when these folks that have been hurt by church and have given up on God are once again included in the family. And so Monday night I went out and sat down with some of those folks and got to, know, got to meet some new people. I'm looking for more and more opportunities. to. I love y'all. I really do. I love hanging out with you. But i got to meet some folks that don't that haven't experienced the acceptance that you and I have. So I'm going out and finding a way to do it because hope has to be matched with something that we bring to the table. For what are you hoping? What are you going to do about it? I encourage you to write those things down. And then begin to hold yourself accountable to move in that direction. It is a great day to be the church. We've got opportunities to do stuff that five years ago we never would have been able to do. So let's move on in faith and in hope of all that God wants to accomplish in and through us. Amen. I invite you to either stand or remain seated for our invitation and join with us in singing My Hope is Built. Number 368 in the hymnals. The altar is open for prayer. For any concern that you have, the doors of the church are open for membership. If God is calling you, I invite you to come as we sing.
we invite you to be seated for just a couple more minutes. We have a celebration today that we all get to share in together. Uh, Anna Posey has come requesting membership. She's a baptized believer already, but she's come requesting membership at Forest Lake United Methodist. If you've not had a chance to meet Anna yet, I hope that you'll, uh, we'll give you a chance at the end of the service. I had the privilege, the great honor, of doing Josh and Anna's wedding just a, uh, just a couple of months ago. And a beautiful, beautiful time together. And it is so great to welcome her into our family officially. She's been a part of us already, but it's good to make this official. I will share with her our vows of membership. I also find this is a great time for all of us to renew our own vows. As you hear the vows that Anna will take in just a moment, it's a chance for you to listen again and to rededicate yourselves, ourselves, to the promises that we made when we joined. Anna, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? According to the grace given to you, will you remain a faithful member of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representative in the world? Now the United Methodist vow. Will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and support this congregation with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. Amen. Welcome to Forest Lake. So good to have you as part of the family. All right. And I commend her to you as well. I'm, I'll invite you all to join me in the narthex when I go out for the benediction so that everyone can have a chance to greet you and welcome you to the family as well, okay? Great to have you as part of us, Anna. All right. And now we'll, you all receive the benediction. And you all just walk out with me as we go, okay? Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ go with you one and all. May the Holy Spirit fill us, give us the ability to work alongside God as co-creators to accomplish all that we hope for in the name of Jesus. Now in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. Amen.